Hey, Nana. Oh. Hi, Laura. How are you? Good. How are you today? Oof. Had a had a day. <laughs> it's it's been a busy. Oh, yeah. Anthony, how are you? I think I'm sipping in early. Yeah, this is really early for you. We gotta mark this down. Uh, we can't hear you. It's following me. Pardon me. Oh, it's spam. Let me. There we go. Hi, sure. Melissa. Hi, Melissa. How are you? Melissa, look I'm at good. The I didn't see you at the wellness fair. No. Oh, we no. I was, I was up in New Hampshire. Oh, good for you. Yeah. My people yeah, we, from, um, we were right near the Relay for Life site. Yeah, they were good. They, they were good enough to take it. So um, I didn't have to do it. Yeah, I was finishing up my camp duties. Oh, camp really nurse. Good, good for nothing. <laughs> I love camp nurse. We had, what was this dog's name? I want to say Rufus, but that wasn't it. Albus, that was, anyways, we had this awesome collie who we think we should go like briefly get trained as a therapy support dog because he was so good. Oh, that's and nice. Huh? So good that I think he might have been trained by watching Lassie because every so often <laughs> oh, he would, he would nice. us and he would connect with his eyes and he'd go, oh, you know, and stuff. And I was like, where's Timmy? Is he in the well? Like <laughs> <laughs> some don't remember Lassie. I know. Uh, I've seen blank faces. I but, do. And this, I don't know. but uh but this dog was great. I had kids with we had quite a storm of uh stinging things and we found out that um a tree had been support the sap of some poor oak tree that had gotten exposed through woodpeckers was hosting four different colonies of flying stinging things that were oh. not honeybees wow so i was I was like, well, what shall we do with our bee stings today? So, you know, no epi was used, but almost. You see up here everything? Uh, I can see everybody. Oh, come on. Don't you want to give an epi? I love giving those. I prefer to test it with an orange. Oh, no. <laughs> That's quite the harpoon. You're mean, Elaine. <laughs> no, I'm not mean. It saved a life. So I know. I know. That was know, the good part. It saved him. It really yeah. saved this, this person. Yeah, so I was just thankful that. that I knew. Thankful that I knew. I was at people before with paddles, but I've never had to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, that and the old fashioned precordial thumps. I don't want to do that anymore. I did that too. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm thumping you now. The good old thing. All right. Can you guys hear, can you, can you guys hear me now? Yep. Me, yep. boss. All right. All righty. That's better. I had to call in from the I had a call from the phone. I can hear you, Cindy. Thank you. Oh, really? Oh, your audio on Zoom's not working? I don't know why. I connected it to my headset, but um, the computer's not connecting. Uh, it's, so I dial in from my phone, so I, at least I get the audio. I have the video on the screen. But Okay. I'm not getting any feedback, so that's good. I don't think so. I've muted, I've muted the sound from my laptop, so it should be fine. Yeah, it should be all right. Okay, that sounds good. So we have quite a few people. Um, is it okay if we wait just a couple minutes? Dan, Dan Thompson will be on pretty quick, pretty yeah, shortly. We can always do minutes as well. Oh, yes, that would be good idea. Hello. 
no, maybe, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Maybe we'll call the meeting to order and do the minutes while we wait for him to get going. Um, six o'clock, August 17th, 2022, we'll call this Board of Health meeting to order. Um, we have Laurel Gorbel, Elaine Silva, me, Candace Linehan, Anthony Choi, and Aaron Hull, Cindy Longo, Melissa Lowry. We have some public, uh, we have the press. Um, so why don't we talk about the minutes? I believe these are the minutes from the 15th, uh, 615. Any, um, any comments, any proposed amendments or anything? Madam Chair, no comments. I um, propose to, to accept the minutes as presented. I'll second that motion. All right, uh, all in favor? Orville, aye. Or aye. Linehan, aye. So moved. Um, Okay. Um, do we want would I to? Be, oh, oh, sorry. Would I be able to do a couple of introductions? I know it's not on the agenda, um, but if we just there's a couple of new staff members on. Yeah, that would be great. Oh, sorry. Okay, sounds good. Um, so uh, you guys have all obviously met Aaron. Um, Aaron is our senior health inspector. She'll be joining us today's meeting. Um, we have a new we have a new staff member, uh, Sandra Brown. Uh, she's joining us as the assistant uh, public health nurse for the town of Wakefield. Uh, we've been very we're very excited to have Sandra. Um, she's been great, um, and she's been helping us a lot with the camps as we move into the second half of the summer here. Um, Sandra, do you want to give us a little bit of your background? So I started in pediatrics at Children's Hospital in the 70s, so dating myself and worked through um, a, a number of hospitals and so forth, it ended up in the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. I also worked at the Department of Mental Health, just sort of rotated through some of the um, departments of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. Not to mention Sandra was also one of our um, contact tracers during the height of COVID. Um, she had the unfortunate or fortunate duty of being in the Melrose Public Schools. Uh, we threw her right in, and she uh, she was amazing. She was one of our uh, biggest factors in connecting the nurse, our school nurses with our uh, with our board of health and our health department. Um, so Sandra, uh, you, you know the great work that you did over there um, was uh, was one of the things that really helped us, and we're hoping that you know um, this will be a good fit for you. Thank you. Welcome, I'm excited Sandra. to I'm excited to be here. Welcome, Sandra. Welcome. Welcome, Sandra. Nice to be with you in a little different light this time. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. We also have Melissa on, um, as you guys know, Melissa, uh, public health nurse. Um, we also have Dan Thompson. Um, this is your, I think this is the first time you guys are meeting. So Dan is our regional health inspector from the Shared Services Grant. Um, so welcome, Dan. Dan's been great. He's been with us for, is it, has it been two or three months now, Dan? I think it's been a little over two months now, yeah. Just just over two months, but um, he's blowing through inspections at an incredible rate. Uh, we just don't want him to burn out. So um, yeah, but uh, we're happy to have you on. Uh, do you want to give us a little bit of your background? Yeah, of course. So before I started in Melrose, I was the associate director in Marshfield. So I handled pretty much every sort of inspection you can imagine in Marshfield besides septic. Um, and yeah. Great. Thank you, Dan. And I think I think that's it. Okay. Welcome, welcome, Dan. Welcome, everybody. Um, you know, I think I may have misspoke. I didn't realize that uh, Sandra, you are a new member of our team. I don't see any public on for participation right now. Uh, anybody? See anything different? I think we have I think we have one person, um, Neil uh, Zolot from the Wakefield Daily Item. Um, looks like that's the only person from the public. Neil, are you planning to participate or just to listen? The press generally and, listens, and then at the end, sometimes there's an opportunity for clarification where you could call the chair or the director. Is that helpful to you? Do 
Did you get that, Neil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, so, Candace, it might be good to mute um, the item until the end and then give an opportunity. That's a great idea. Okay, Neil. Um, so, we'll mute you for now. And if, if you need to make a comment uh, at the end, we can address that. There he is. Okay. Um, all right. So, Dan, since you're here, why don't um, you talk to us a little bit about your inspections? Yeah, uh, the Socorro specifically or just my inspections in general? I think we were planning to just get into Socorro tonight. Um, mm -hmm. If there's other stuff, maybe we can put on, on the agenda for the next meeting. We do have kind of a lot to get through tonight. So maybe we'll just stick yeah. to Socorro tonight. No worries. Yeah. So on July 27th, uh, I did the inspection over at Socorro and it was not good. There were definitely a lot of issues. Um, seven critical violations, um, which obviously is not acceptable, especially for a risk for uh, food establishment. It's it's really just deplorable um, and there's no excuse. They, they have a very high risk, um, more so than any other restaurant, and they have a big responsibility to make sure that everything is perfect. Um, that being said, uh, so I went back a couple of times um, just to check in on them to make sure that they were fixing things um, at like a reasonable time. Um, and I went back yesterday was my final time going back. That was the third time. And everything has been addressed. Everything has been fixed. So <laughs> that's good, at least. Um, the owner, Mark, he, he should be here. He said he was going to attend the meeting. Um, but I talked to Mark and, you know, he was very, um, you know, he, he was able to listen and he understood, you know, like he has a big role to fill with, um, with keeping his restaurant as clean as possible and making sure that he's as compliant as possible. So he didn't really give me any pushback. He was like, okay, I'll try to get everything done. Um, so that was good. But th the main issue on why I wanted to bring them in is they do have a history of bad reports. Um, and there has been issues of foodborne illness that has been filed also um, against Socorro. So I don't really want to attack them for having a bad past or having bad inspections in the past. I just think it's important that this does not happen again, especially because it's already happened in the past. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I just wanna make sure that the owner, Mark, understands that we're serious about this and it, it just can't happen again. Okay. And it seems like he was willing um, to make the changes you suggested, address all the things. Yes, Mark was, he was listening and he was not giving me a, a hard time whatsoever. He, he understood that everything needed to be addressed and fixed and he, he did so. Okay. Laurel and Elaine, do you guys have any knowledge, like previous knowledge of stuff? It, it's definitely before me. Well, we, yeah, not not so much on this establishment, um, but um, just using our historical perspective, um, when we have had a, uh, establishments that have been challenged with compliance, I don't know that, and Elaine, you may remember better but we had them hire a consultant because a health inspector's job is not um to do the work to you know to make sure that they're in compliance they, they're there to do the inspection and you know I, i'm very proud of the fact that we have a tradition of really strong health inspectors who have been informative and to bring people back to compliance but when we have such issues it's been very helpful for us to tell them to hire a consultant for a period of time um, so that we we really have better assurance that they have checked all the boxes. Um, I did see in the report that was really nicely done that you know we may have some language barrier issues, in which case that you know a consultant 
who either A, is familiar with the language or B, can point out um, where language appropriate literature should be, such as hand washing postings so that they're, so that they're understood and have someone who you know, can confirm that those, that that signage is correct. It's very difficult to do um, training and understand compliance when we have language barriers. So I, I don't remember, Elaine, if we're allowed to compel a hiring. I feel like we did in the past. Can, and we can compel. Time. You can compel if it's been multiple and it's the same violations. Am I correct, Erin? I know yes. in the past that's what I've done um, in my own um, job as the director with a food inspector. If we find that it's the same same type of violations over and over again. First of all, there has been indication, Dan, I'll tell you, you had a phenomenal report. I was having a, a blast reading. It. <laughs> it's well, so much you, fun for me to read that stuff. Yeah. And um, it's especially if they if they keep coming back and, you know, if there is a language thing, then I would recommend that, you know, you contact DP, uh, DPH's uh, food and see if they do have somebody. And I would recommend if this has been the same thing over and over, as we've said in the past two years, I think they've been brought up two or three times, if I'm not mistaken. I had asked Cindy, Cindy, did you see anything in their racket? Okay. Um, so yeah, I sent, I sent um, back to 2017, their um, inspection reports. Um, and there was the two foodborne illness reports in there um other stuff but I'm not the inspector so I don't really read I didn't read it you know read it through but um <laughs> we did not ever bring them if I can, I mean I can't remember go, I, they've never come to our board we've never brought them in bring them in but we did report on them I do remember that yes. and talking about it but maybe it is something Dan if you look back and you feel that you know that might be a thing and also I, I had a question for you Dan how is the HACCP was it really up to par or did it really need a review and a rewriting or what did you think of that? Their house of plan was great, honestly. Was um, I was very pleased with it. Uh, I read through every page. Um, it's all very compliant and it's all very up to date. Not only that, but um, the manager that was on site at the time, his name's JQ. Uh, he tested the pH of his sushi rice with both the meter and the strips and had no issue doing it whatsoever. Um, all of their logs were great. Um, pH was in range between 3.7 and 4.6. It was 4.1 both times he tested. Every, everything was great in terms of HACCP. So they had that for them. Maybe we'll take from you, Dan, if you feel that, you know, we um, should ask him to call in a consultant and um, have a consultant on hand for like 30 days and see if they can work with him and work with them between the language, possible language barrier and the possible, you know, repeated, you know, um, offenses, maybe that would help them. Yeah, I think it could totally be beneficial for them. Um, on top of that, I'm also looking into getting in some, uh, some signage for them, uh, just to kind of post in the kitchen and just in places where, you know, because one of the big things they had there was they weren't properly storing their food um, you know, like they were putting raw meats over like ready to eat foods, which obviously is a big no, no. Uh, but I didn't see any postage or any like anything really kind of helping people out of how to properly store food. So I've been looking into, you know, trying to get some resources for them to post around the kitchen so that, you know, maybe a reminder like that could serve them pretty well. And do you have a plan to go back and see them in a couple of months, Dan, or what's the, what are the next steps to make, make sure that what's been fixed stays fixed? Absolutely. So I, I mean, this has happened to me a few times where I've had, to, I've had situations with restaurants like this. And typically what I'll do is I'll go back unannounced within the next couple of weeks, maybe three weeks max from now. And just drop in, see what's going on. And, you know, it, I already know it's not going to be perfect, but I really just want to make sure the big things like cross-contamination are not going to happen again. 
but yes, I will be visiting them sometime within the next two to three weeks just to drop in. Okay. Madam Chair, I see a new phone on and that may be Sephora, I'm not sure. M could be Mark, maybe. Uh, whoever M phone is, could you take yourself off mute and introduce yourself? Oh, hi, uh, this is Mark from Secora. Hi, Mark, welcome. We were just Thank talking you. about your restaurant. I'm Candice, I'm the chair of the board. Okay, hi, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Dan was just talking a little bit about the inspection and how, um, how things went. Um, do you have any questions, anything you wanted to share or ask of us? Uh, no, he's very helpful for the for, um, like, uh, food, conduct, food uh, quality control, yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, I uh, I worked overnight uh, last night to, to fix the, um, the all the problems, and I also sent him all the pictures for what we have done um, um, for those problems. Yeah. Okay. Dan, did we ever receive the verification of uh, parasite destruction? Yes, Mark okay. did email me this morning. Um, I think it was three parasite destruction forms. So he is covered with that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to recommend um, that contingent on Dan's follow-up inspection. Um, should there not, you know, should should it be determined that there is not consistent compliance with all regulations, that we move to. Um, get a consultant in there to to work with them um more regularly uh I, elaine i think said a, a month i i would need to go back in the records to see what the plan in a prior establishment was but um we it was a very good um investment for the establishment i don't believe we've had any issues since and it's been years course we got thrown under the bus and it was our fault that everything got moved in the store but you know it, it was okay um so that that would be my thinking so so what we were talking about um to the owner the, to the manager of uh, uh, sakura is is actually pulling a consultant beyond our own inspectors to work with your staff more um on, on a longer term you know several hours a day over the course of a month to really make sure people have nailed it. But that expense would be on the establishment, not on the town. Um, and there are agencies out there and we can certainly help you. We can't recommend one, but we can certainly, um, our inspectors can access a list from which you would choose. And, and that has really served, it, it serves the community well, but it also serves the establishment well because it, it does then um, kind of affirm your commitment to quality assurance. So I think it can work as a win-win. It is not meant to be punitive. It's meant to really assure the quality of everything that's coming out of the establishment. Uh, actually, like um, all the problems that mentioned, uh, like um, I uh, clearly understand. I will put an eye on um, all those problems. I will make sure, like uh, from now on, everything is um, is is um, is by the book. So, yeah, I'm confident I can um, I can work it out with all the stuff or with Dan. Yeah. So what what we're saying is is if those efforts don't seem to be enough, the next step would be to get a consultant to spend a little bit more time. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I understand you. And we appreciate the, the work you've done to bring things back into compliance. I think we just want to support you in staying compliant. Okay. Thank you for joining. Uh, Dan, anything else about Sakura tonight? Um, no, I think that's pretty much everything. I guess I would just want to reiterate with Mark, you know, the board, we're here to help you more than anything, you know, it's just we need to take things seriously when it gets to this point, because uh, at the top of everything, we're trying to make sure everyone stays safe. And if someone goes out to eat, they don't get sick. Um, so 
again, you know, I, I hope everything works out. I hope we can maintain a good relationship. And if you have any issues, you know, you have my email, please feel free to reach out. Okay. Thank you for your help. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Dan. Of course. Um, okay. Do we want to talk about um, a statement about uh, reproductive choice? Um, yeah. So, oh, I just want I just wanted to go off. So, I was originally emailed um, by the Winchester Board of Health um, just as a notification that they had sent out the statement. Um, this was obviously um, uh, initiated from the Supreme Court uh, decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, you know, the recommendation would be for the board to consider maybe releasing a statement uh, in support. Um, I think it's I think it's pretty clear. Um, a lot of what we do in the health realm, uh, reproductive health services, um, that obviously includes safe abortion. That's the basic public health right, and I think it's, it's very important for us to you know take a stand. Um, and make that statement uh, in solidarity with the rest of the communities that are also issuing statements on this as well. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that would be great. Um, do Do we have any um, model statements from which to? Yes. Yeah, so I, I believe I believe it was sent out, but uh, if not, I can send it out again. This was from the Winchester Board of Health. Um, they yeah. sent out a sample statement uh, regarding uh, regarding the. Uh, the decision, as well as making a comment on safe abortion as a basic, uh, basic public health right. Uh, did you guys receive this uh, statement? I don't recall. I, re I recall the issue, but I didn't see the attachment, but I could. Same. I think we did. Um, I may have gotten it through mass public health nurses, maybe. I think MAPHM, Melissa, sent it out for the local health departments. My question to you also, Anthony, has our coalition yeah. also signed? Has everyone in our coalition gone along with this? Have they discussed this? I believe um, I believe they have discussed it. I don't think they've released a statement, but I think it's something that uh, we're, we're coordinating with all the uh, coalition partners to also to work on as well. And where would we would this statement be viewable like on our website or would we publish it in another media like it would be we great should, to we should definitely. Yeah, we should definitely make it available through the website. Um, Melissa obviously has a great tie to MAPHN as well as Elaine, obviously. Um, so we should share it within our networks. Uh, we would also most likely share it with our, our um, partners at MHOA. Uh, basically, any you know any uh, connections we have throughout the state, we should uh, we should do that. That would be great. And I don't I don't know I, I don't feel compelled to wait until like, the coalition makes a statement. Um, I would be interested in supporting a statement if we felt like it was right but i feel like as a as a town we could make a statement of our own has melrose done anything melrose uh same uh same similar situation um the board of health is in discussions of this as well um they're looking to in issue a, a statement that's separate from the coalition um just just seeing as the two the two groups are are some are autonomous obviously um, so the Board of Health will be considering it separately from the uh, Melrose Health and Wellness Coalition. Okay. So would we um, be um, in the right line of direction, Anthony, in doing the statement together with Melrose since we work together with them and we support each other and we support yeah, the same um, health I systems? Absolutely. Um, I think it would be, um, I think it would be appropriate unless, unless Laurel, Candace, if you guys have anything um, to add about that, we'd be, we'd be happy to work on a joint statement. I think maybe just from a logistics standpoint, maybe what we can do is we can work on a draft and then we can run it by everybody um, to make any kind of edits or any suggestions um, to do that. It might be easier than trying to craft one on, on, on live TV here. Um, but um, yeah, so what do you guys think? Would you be uh, in support of doing kind of a joint statement? Yeah, I mean, we would read it. And I think as long as everybody felt comfortable, then that would be great to be with Melrose on it. Would you write it or who would write it? 
Um, I, I would probably write it and then um, get draft started and then get everybody's in, uh, feedback. Okay. I saw the Winchester one. Um, thank you, Cindy. It, it's pretty straightforward, um, kind of short and sweet, but maybe that's actually a good thing. Um, just to be clear about our support and, you know, not really add too many other details. So I, I want to read this, but, um, and I certainly know what I feel personally. I do. I do want to be cautious about um, supporting this in in a in in a way that is appropriate, but is also not inflaming, so that other work we do may be affected. So we certainly have voices within our community where I, I just think we need to be mindful of where we go. Right. So you know, I'm a I'm a psychiatric provider, someone tells me what they think, I need to leave it there. But I also need to be safe. And I need to be approachable by someone, you know, to, to someone with a with a different opinion. So I just, I just am wary of unintended consequences that we might, um, that we, I, I just want to be careful. You see what I'm saying? Like, I just, you know, we are, we are service to all. We don't, you know, we want good public health. That is our, that is our goal. Separating an individual issue as important as that is. I just want us to be careful that we are then not inviting some kind of other element that may detract from the other work that we do you hear what i'm saying i think i, I think that's i think mm -hmm. i think that's a really i think that's a really good way to put it because like you said this is you know obviously a divisive political issue right this is it's impossible to separate a public health issue from a, from a public discourse uh, we talk about these things um one of the things is obviously and you guys will be on the lookout for that when i've crafted the draft mm -hmm. but essentially we're going to be looking similar to what winchester is basically saying is we support you know, access to reproductive health information, right? We, you know, funding options, you know, any kind of resource that we can direct them to and also to support equity, which is basically what they're referring to here with, you know, with language barriers and with different ways of, you know, putting that information out there. So really, I think um, our job as a health department and then, you know, as, you know, as an extension of the Board of Health as well, you know, is to make sure that access is available uh, to information, you in know, in a format that is, um, that is easily ascertainable by the rest of the community. So, um, and I, agree, I, I hear what you're saying. And I want to make yeah, you know, hand, yep. hand, handled without care, we yeah. could have unintended consequences. So I just want us to be mindful that this is, you know, that that this is. Um, I mean, we have learned, right? You know, we we were heroes two years ago, and then the bad guys within this past year because of varying opinions around pandemic wariness and you know no you know we know what we're we're about sometimes less messaging is better <laughs> because we can just go on so i just um i i, I look forward to to revisiting this but then i do think it's important that we say something though I, I think this is a public health issue and it's not the first time like you mentioned laurel that we've had to possibly take on a divisive issue but I wouldn't have made a different decision when we had our discussions about masking and pandemic safety. And I, I wouldn't change my decision to support access to reproductive options, even because someone may be unhappy with my feeling on that. I think this is a public health issue and I think it's our responsibility to say something. Agree, we can be mindful of our language, but I think something should be out there. I agree. I think that, um... I kind of pondered this and kind of did a lot of reading what other health departments and spoke to a few public health nurses and that's what it is. I mean, you know, we want to support for the for the general public without offending and without crossing boundaries, I think, you know, and I think that's what we'd have to do and, you know, be very general um, in the draft and then see what it says and see if it really is what we want to give out as a uh, support message. You know, and we're in Massachusetts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we do mm -hmm. have good, 
good legislation on the books. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, that is the lane we stay in. And thank God, I agree with it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, more to follow. I look forward to seeing how it goes. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Absolutely. Um, you guys can be on the lookout for, for a draft uh, relatively soon, uh, okay. hopefully, hopefully within the week. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else on reproductive health services? Any last comments or anything? Okay. Um, so, Anthony, do you want to do a health director's report? What's the, what's the size of your report or should we talk animal regs first? Um, let's talk, let's talk animal regs first. Okay. Um, cause we have, we do, so Aaron, Aaron's on as well. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of go through, um, we can pick up where we left off last time, but, um, so basically what I sent you guys just now is a kind of a cleaned up version. Um, there's, there's some edits in there, so it makes it look a little, it's a little easier to look at, but it's the okay, same so thing from last you, time. Can you just yeah. share your screen so that we can all look at it at the same time? Yeah. So yeah. Back and forth? That's a good idea. Um, is, am I able to, I think Candace, you might be the yeah, host, but mm, mm. yep. Okay, you're the co-host. <laughs> All right, perfect, thank you. Second in command. <laughs> all right, look at that. Okay, so can you guys all see the, the Word document? There it is, perfect, got it, thank you. All right, perfect. So um, we can kind of, I mean, last time we made a lot of, we made a lot of comments and changes, but maybe it's just cleaner if we start from the top. And then, um, so every, all the changes that we're uh, proposing are in the red. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to make some, make some edits here and then um, see if we can get, uh, agree on something. So um, going through, uh, so actually first I want to, I want to give a huge um, shout out to our interns from over the summer. Um, Claire and Caitlin from uh, BU, uh, they were absolutely instrumental in helping us do a, you know, a deep dive into the animal regulations. Um, they were helped, they were very helpful in doing some research from other towns, looking at other animal regulation, any kind of best practices that are out there. Um, they did a very thorough job looking through the document to make sure that there, you know, there, there's small details here and there that, you know, over time may, may or may not be relevant anymore. So some of these changes are, uh, are much needed. So. Um, so to start in the definition section, uh, we just wanted to clear up um, some of the language. So um, the, the change here would be applicant, a uh, person who seeks or has applied for a permit to keep animals. Um, maybe the best way to go about this would just be if I just keep going through and if you have any, um, if you have any comments, just stop me. Okay. So right here, as you can see, um, we're looking to increase the, uh, to expand the definition here, coop or hen house, which is structure designed for the keeping or housing of poultry. We wanted to include the word, uh, the definition of facility, which is total accommodation to be used for the keeping and care of animals, including but not limited to this land, stable, pen, or coop. A hen, a female chicken. Chicken will also be used to refer to hens. Um, a loft, a structure that's designed for keeping or housing of pigeons. A pen or a run, which is an enclosed outdoor space designed to confine chickens or other animals and to provide protection from predators. Um, really, this is this is kind of stemming from you know there's there's best practices with chickens. You don't want them you know enclosed enclosed in a small space. The protection really is designed for the protection from predators. Um, so this is the spirit in which the uh, the regulations are are coming from. Um, pest management pigeons uh, pigeons shall mean shall shall mean a member of the um, Columbidia uh, Columbidia family of birds um, that includes racing, fancy, and sporting pigeons. Um, it's a very specific definition for pigeons. Uh, we have unsanitary conditions, general requirements for license. Okay, so before I move on, was there any questions with definitions uh, before or anything that we wanted to add? No. Okay, so with section five, um, we decided to take out this section right here. Um, it's pretty descriptive. Um, any person desiring to obtain a license shall submit the following, the source of each animal, um, a written plan for the storage, waste or disposal, a written plan for the disposal of animals, picture of sketch of the building and the pens which house the, fam uh, the animals. Um, 
it's probably a little bit more descriptive than this one. The entire premises, this is this, this part we are um, proposing to take out. So basically, it says to, descri to describe the entire premises where the animals are kept uh, in the intended facilities to house and accommodate the animals. We basically broke it down in these bullet points here uh, to be a little more clear. Um, and we still require a plot plan that shows the lot borders and any setbacks from property lines and structures. The process of which um, they apply for a permit, the applicant shall still shall notify each abutter by registered or certified mail uh, with a return receipt requested. Um, this section right here, I believe, may have been redundant to this previous section. So for, uh, for the purposes of the regulation, a butter shall be considered any property um, by any owner of the property bounded wholly or in part. So this is, you know, in, in terms of the proximity to the property. So if they're uh, abutting the property line, um, I believe this section was taken out because of the wording. So one, one just caveat about plot plan. I don't know if we should write, you know, plot plan as plot is defined in the town register. I don't, I don't know where we keep our plot plans. I don't know if it's building or not, because we, we have never asked people to get a surveyed plot plan. They generally pull what they have we're fairly informal unless we have, you know, unless, unless there's an abutter issue, I'm assuming. Yeah. You could just take out the word plot and just have it be a plan. So, I mean, how oh, no, I, I think it's actually we... really important to have it as plot. Yeah. Isn't it down in like the assessor's office or something that I think a couple of the last people that actually built like quite a fancy you know, chicken, chicken house, I call them. Um, they did have like a, like a detailed plot plan. And I think you can get that. I think that's, isn't that from the assessor's office? Either either assessor or building has what yeah. building has on. If you are actually building and you're putting stuff on, for, I mean, building code is that you have to, I, I believe, get, you know, make sure that your plot, that you know what your plot plan says, <laughs> essentially. Um, so never mind. I think we should, just, I think, I think it's important to understand it's a plot, but I'm just, I'm just, um, Telling the department to be aware of getting ready to know where someone could get a plot plan. Because they may not know. They should. Okay. When you buy your house, you should be getting a plot plan. It should be in the package. And, I mean, we, we can confirm with the town, but I believe I believe the assessor's office would have would have access to a plot plan. Um, they could yeah. request it from there. Yeah, yeah, and the assessor's office plans, they might um, like Laurel mentioned, like an the exact you know um lines might not be right but we've you know we're not requiring a survey to be done unless there would be unless there was an issue um but yeah the yeah. but a, i think a rough plot plan like that's that should be, <laughs> that's usually acceptable with their approximate um property lines um i will say i think i may have caught um may have caught a little bit of a typo here i believe it's a plot plan showing lot lot bound borders of dimension of the facility setbacks from property lines location of potable water i believe it's probably trying to say um yeah so i will i'll make that change real quick um So, um, so just made a change to locate um, setbacks and setbacks from property lines and location of potable water. That's uh, that's the change we just made. So, um, from what I understood, we were deciding on keeping plot plan as kind of the uh, the requirement here. Is that correct? Okay, that sounds good. So, um, moving on. So, there's still notification for uh, abutters. Um, See, are there any other changes from here? Okay, so we took out this section right here. We were discussing licenses. So licenses are, um, are issued by the Board of Health. Um, and then there was a section about if um, an animal uh, under license is killed or you know under someone that has a license that has an animal that is killed or dies um, there's an investigation and a written report to the board 
Um, is that necessary? Um, Cause I think we took, I think we, I think we saw that we weren't sure if that was absolutely necessary that the chickens were or anything that was reported to the board of health. And is there anything in these guidelines that say that the owner has to report that to the board? That the owner has there to was report to the there, there was. There was previously, and that's what this section is right here, but I don't know that there is a requirement. It might, it could have, it could be a local requirement, I guess, but there's nothing um, that I, I think I, I it was done already. just in terms of safety, like with bird flu, because if bird flu is here right. and it's determined, then the, that's when um, the agriculture department of agriculture comes in and they supersede us and then they, they destroy the, uh, the whole flock has to be done. And I think it also was done just in case an animal, if someone had a chicken and they found them, um, a lot of times people find them and they don't know what predator killed it. Was it just a, um, a chance that maybe a coyote or was it a local dog? Was it local what? I think that that's why they want to um, always want to kind of know and it leads to um, you know, a little bit of an investigation as to how the animal died and to make sure there wasn't any you know, animal cruelty done on purpose, I think. I, I don't know. Erin, you may know more. I mean, that's what I was taught. Um, I don't know. I've actually, I've never seen this in a regulation before. I was, um, Heard of it. Um, yeah. Bird flu training, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, because I would say um, we do have the link on our website for how to report dead birds. Um, but other than, and we do share information that we get about avian flu. Um, with our chicken permit holders, um, but other than that, um, I don't know. I've never, I've never seen guidance like this that you know people should notify the department when an animal uh, dies. What about an animal that? Um, let me ask you if you know someone has a dog or a cat and they go out in the yard and they find them, you know, and there's no substantial reason why. I mean, the, the animal may not have been treated for some kind of um, illness or, you know, like a cancer or something like that. Who do, is there any regulations anywhere in Wakefield who we report that to? Like if a person's pet dies? And they yeah, don't... like in the, like you found them in the yard and, and I don't think there is anything, right? We don't have anything. I don't, I don't think there's any regulations in Wakefield about that. If we suspect any kind of foul play or anything, I guess, um, we would, we would, might, we might notify animal control. Um, but I don't think that there's anything who would formally report that, we would that death. Would that death be reported to the health department or to the animal control officer? Actually, Aaron, you might be able to, um, shed some light on this. So I know we have, we have to do, we have to report a barn, but oh, the animal control officer has to work on a barn book every year. No, for the, the, state. the animal yeah. inspector does the barn book. Oh, sorry, animal inspector. Yeah. You're right. Animal inspector does that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the animal so... inspector does the barn book and rabies control. Um, as far yeah. as reporting deaths, um, all I know is about reporting bird deaths. Um, but I, I'm not sure yeah. about reporting any other mysterious. That would be an animal control question, I I think. Yeah. I think we would call Bev. I'm also wondering, yeah. you know, if there is a you know, and again, it may not happen. It would be the choice of, of the animal owner, but I'm sure veterinarians have some process if they're worried about, you know, if they catch something that, that is reportable, but I, I don't know vet medicine at all. Um, so. Okay. Um, I mean, in the absence of that, make this, get it out. Yeah, because the police would investigate animal cruelty. Yeah. No, but let's say, you know, let's say, rabies came up oh, okay. so you would think you know you would yeah. think that um or we've had dogs die of lyme disease or, or that sort of thing so so i don't know if we have any vet back to public health um communications i i feel like there must be at least on a state level that's an assumption i'm, I'm not quite sure could we um I'm willing to take this out because it's not standard for, you know, for regulations in general, but it would be nice kind of as a sidebar to ask our animal control and or inspector um, if there's a process just so that we know, you know, and, and, and we need to understand the whole loop because when anyone who answers a phone gets a call and we go, um, you know, that's, that's not a good look. So it, it you know, it, it's not a good service. So 
now that we've asked this odd question, we kind of need to kind of have, you know, put it, put it in the, in the margin and say, okay, so if anyone asked with that question, you know, where would we go? And just, just kind of walk through where the, um, I don't think it needs to be in the regs, but I think we need to be prepared to answer that question should it come up. That sounds good. Um, that's a good idea. So something we can do to follow up uh, with Bev um, after is to kind of ask to see what, what processes already exist and then maybe what we can do uh, if there's kind of report. Um, okay, that sounds good. So we're so we're agreeing to take this this part this portion out. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the next so the next section uh, under construction changes. So this was this was something that we had considered. So basically, if any person is proposing a remodel of a building or you know some structure that houses uh, the animals, um, that they can they should submit a new application for a license. Um, I think maybe it would just be sufficient if they just submitted a new plot plan. Um, because if they already have, if they have already submitted an application, they already had a permit. Um, if there's any changes, they can just submit amendments to it, uh, and we can review that. So, um, are there uh, any questions about just requiring a new plot plan and not an entirely new application? No, that sounds good. Great. You may just want to add, you know, and it will be treated as an amendment to the original, and treated as an amendment to the original application, because <laughs> otherwise, you know. People will be like, well, do I have to pay again? <laughs> <laughs> if they're volunteering. Not the building inspector, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, that sounds good. Okay, so the next section, fees and permits. Um, I know we, we had a long discussion about this yeah. part last time. Um, so essentially, um, I think there's just some wording here. Fee for all licenses shall be included in the Board of Health regulation fee. So this is more of a wording change. Um, I believe we changed all of these fees. Um, should we decide on what the fees should be? I thought we did. Is it in an email? Cindy mentioned it to us. Um... Yep. Um, no, it's not in an email, but it was in our last meeting. And you, um, you mentioned it. You sort of summed up the minutes, I think. Um, I feel like I read it today, Cindy. Um, we weren't making any real big changes. Um, I think we were going with uh, an initial permit. Fee. Oh yeah, 30, 30 for initial renewal of 15 and the stable fee of 75. Yep. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Okay, so it was 30, so initial, I'll, I'll clean this up, but initial permit fee, permit fee of $30, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, $30, a renewal fee of $15, okay. And then, um, and then what was, what was the last one you said it was a-, it was a the, the stable fee would be $75. Oh, yes, correct. Okay, so stable fee. Uh, Thank you for that reminder. Uh, yeah, no problem. Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll put this back into the format, but um, okay, so initial permit fee of 30, renewal fee of $15, and a stable fee of 75. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, we kept this part, permits are not transferable, uh, there's no changes there. Um, so just some changes in terms of wording here. So this is the section, section nine now regulations with respect to horses, goats, and sheep. Um, so we got rid of all of this. Um, let me see. Um, I was still trying to remember. I was like, what is this comment? I was like, um, yes. Okay. So it looks like. Actually, now I don't even know why this was taken out. Um, well, is it because we're not keeping so, cows? Are people not keeping cows? Is that like right? Or is it also I think, I think that's because just... because in the very top we talk about in keeping with current agricultural practices? So I wonder if we thought this was redundant. Right. Just a guess. Yeah, this might this might be redundant. So um, 
we do still have some. So we still have fencing, housing, bedding, you know, all this. Um, so basically, they all have to yeah. fall. Oh, okay, here. So they they all fall generally accessible agricultural practices. So this this is an easier way for us to sum it up. Okay. Um, some the foreign technological barrier. <laughs> Just so. yes. Um, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a legit, it's a legitimate. Uh, well, I don't know. Is that, is that the correct term? I don't know. Um, it's like a Maslow yeah. thing, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I believe I believe this has not changed though. Um, so okay, there's also this right here. Um, housing should be located on land with good drainage. All houses should be at least 100 feet away from swamp, stream, ponds, well, property line, 100 feet from any public or private way, and any abutters dwelling in a 50 feet from property line. So, um, are we looking to maintain? this the 50 feet from a property line is this something that we should we should discuss or is this something we want to maintain no i think we should maintain it but i i all the prior stuff is hardly any um not many houses in wakefield would meet that um, you know we're just too dense well and i think yeah. i mean it does sort of I mean people have to request meetings for variances more often um which are i mean i Again, I haven't been doing this that long, but have there been times when variances haven't been granted for that reason? Uh, unless the abutters are opposed to it, but if if everybody's on board, would generally they, not. But if we're talking about um, waterways, mm -hmm. I would have a little call with conservation. Yeah, I, I don't think we would manage that on our own. Yeah, that sounds. I agree with that. Erin, are you saying okay. anything? Because I don't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, absolutely. I agree that conservation, um, if it's close to wetlands, a swamp, yeah, any sort of waterways, um, the 50 feet, I don't know, do, I don't know, Anthony, do you even want to talk about what's going on in Melrose with the... Yeah, so <laughs> we, can, we, can shed, we can kind of shed some light on what's going on. So Melrose, you know, we, have, we, have, we also have chicken owners as well. Um, 50 feet uh, in terms of distance from a neighbor, like Ken just said, it's very difficult to maintain. Um, very few properties here have that, uh, have that luxury. So I would say, you know, essentially is, we're trying to figure out is 50 feet, you know, more of a public health designation or is that more of a nuisance uh, designation? We want to make sure that we're being fair. And if you know, if it can be closer than 50 feet, then are we are we setting these um, these expectations, you know, a little bit too high? Um, and if we need to maintain this distance, um, currently in Melrose, there well, last Board of Health meeting in Melrose, there was a discussion about a current um, chicken owner that was requesting variances from other property um, from their butters. And essentially a variance was grant the permit was granted with the variances because um, all of the abutters uh, that they had notified um, had basically uh, agreed that it would be okay for them to be in that proximity. So essentially, um, I think that there are oh, not all abutters. There was one of sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, uh, no, the board actually um, they made uh, setback distances unenforceable in Melrose. So like because they so the issue is that the neighbor does mind, the neighbor doesn't want it close to their property and the board granted the variance anyway. So, right. and determined at that meeting that setback distances do not have anything to do with public health. So, you know, it's not something that should be in the regulations. Oh, okay. So yeah. I don't know if we want to, um, I would say I would just caution the board to, you know. I don't know if we would be able to variances like, carefully. Yeah, or like, yeah. I think it would be challenging to come up with a number that people could agree on. I feel like maybe the question yeah. is more: Do we have, do we have a distance, or do we not have a distance? Yeah. Well, the other. And I think I think that's a, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I mean. I'm just kind of I'm just kind of cataloging a butters issues in the past. So a butters have had, you know, it, it depends on how you define public health, right? So nuisance and stress um, could be in there. And so we have had people who have worried about incessant clucking. Um, we have had people worried about attraction of um, 
coyotes into the neighborhood being compounded with coops. Um, I think that we owe the public, you know, I think we owe a butters the opportunity to address it. So when a, you know, e even even if someone's got a huge, you know, I don't know. I mean, I feel like owner. this, this yeah. owner, this we've had too a lot. big. A hundred a hundred feet may be too big, but I feel yeah. like something kind of sets off an opportunity for a butters to be aware. Yeah. And that that's respectful. You know, that meets the needs of all town members, not just people who um, desire to keep animals. Yeah. It sounds like in these regulations, they do, the owner has to make all abutters aware with certified mail, right? And so yeah. once those right. abutters are made aware, then they would have the opportunity to come to one of our meetings to request a hearing and, and we would discuss. So I was just making sure this isn't the only place where abutters, like I, so all abutters should be aware in this. I, I just missed a beat. My phone rang. Um, so abutters are are aware despite any setback issues. Where yeah, it seemed like up ahead. Of, yeah. Am I missing something, Anthony? That it, the, the the owner has abutters are off. notified regardless of the setback. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Abutter. All abutters are notified. Yes. That's correct. Okay. Via certified mail, right? Oh well, yeah, no. The, you know, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, in a way, this gives a message to abutters that if, you know, the land is that big that, you know, they may not have as much strength in their argument. But I think, you know, you make a good point. Like, what does this really have to do with public health? You know, we have, we have Somerville allowing chickens. I know they don't have that kind of setback. Um, so I'd be okay. I with think, it. I think it would. I think, like you said earlier, though, the important the important consideration for setback really is when there's a body of water involved, uh, and when conservation can can basically give us, you know, their their perspective on it. So, um, I don't know that it's necessarily as important to just have a blanket catch-all kind of, you know, setback distance, but we should probably still leave, you know, that part about the the pond, well, property line, swamp stream, that sort of thing. So. Um, if if you are interested in amending this, um, if it makes sense, then we don't have to be you know, considering variances all the time. But we can, you know, make a decision when there is when abutters do have concerns, um, we can address those. Of course, um, yeah, but we can to, always hear them yeah. at a meeting. Yep. Concerns. That's what we've done in the in the past. If you remember, um, Laura, we had one with the. Um, keeping of a um a pig and i know that a lot of cities um do have some regulations for in regards to pigs as pets or pigs to be used as that one if i recall was being used as a food was being grown oh, yes. for a food source remember yes. yeah and, and huh oh yeah they had a huge piece of land but a lot of times, I think mostly the complaints we usually all get is um, for odors. And I mean, that's something that is a public health. And once they bring it to us and we send somebody out, people usually are pretty good about correcting it, you know. But I agree. I think I would just keep with anything, ask conservation about the swamps and streams and ponds and everything else. Just kind of not put a number in, but just address it as it comes. Okay, so that means if we're if we're looking at that, then we might just want to remove the um, the second the, the two the second and third. So the 100 feet from any public and private way, any abutters dwelling 50 feet, we should just probably take that out, and then you know if there's any abutters concerns, we'll just address them there. Do I agree. Okay. Do you want to add um, conservation commission will be or conservation agent will be consulted when appropriate okay maybe we should we should add it oops add it here we can say something like um any all housing shall be at least 100 feet um and we can say something along the lines of uh pending a or pending a decision by we could do that the conservation. Or consultation with with conservation agent um do we want to remove the words property line from that sentence you're adding on to? Well, that Just, is a conservation. I think that, 
property line, how close you are to conservation land is a I good think, thing. I the, think we need to, I think maybe yeah. we should bring this to the agent and say, is there still, because yeah. there is a constant threshold for anything near that, that um, triggers conservation involvement where they have to look at it. So we need to know what that should is. That, is it a hundred? Right. Is it 50? Should should that be a requirement for all applicants to have gone and run this by conservation to see if they are abutting any conservation land or is that the responsibility I, we should put on the applicant? That, I think you find a... that on your plot plan, don't you usually? If on your plot plan, if your property abuts conservation land, isn't that indicated on your plot Maybe, plan? No. Yeah, not really. I don't know if it's consistently done that. Yeah. I can so I can tell you I suffered through this and it is nowhere on the plot plan until a until a con until you have a plan to do something and then a conservation consultant needs to look at it because it's very changeable. Wetlands are changeable, flooding is changeable. So um, do we have do we have a full time conservation agent in Wakefield? I don't we, we, we don't. We have a we have a conservation committee. Oh, we well, well we have a committee, but then do... Rebecca, is it Rebecca still the agent? What we, have two, we have two part-time. Two okay. part-time. Okay. Yep. So uh, I don't know. Is it reasonable to get a sign? -up? I don't know if that's necessary for everyone. I don't know if it's necessary. Yeah. I just think it would be good to have a, to ask them what the threshold is. Oh, okay. I get what so you're saying. If you yes. keep, if, you, if oh, the threshold okay. is a hundred feet, that's true. And you're with your less than a hundred feet yeah that would trigger you yeah to consult with conservation i'm not sure if there's a footage amount because it's going to matter if you're uphill or down you know like yep. those things are going to matter but too they, for drainage but they absolutely conservation i can i i am oh you think there's a magic sure. number well there are trigger numbers okay you know, okay 50 above this you know changing grading is something so you know I need to say with anthony i don't know if you if if you have a director's meeting anytime soon but just say hey building and conservation can you you know answer this query if somebody wanted to build a fancy coop yeah. and we know that they can get fancy like wall pole woodworker fancy um is there a trigger number for distance that you, know, yeah. you look at this because we don't want you know we don't want the unintended consequence of giving conservation more work because this is not a toxic waste situation but we want to be you know we we want to be mindful that we're working within each other's guidelines so i would just i would just like highlight that and just bring it over to the agent and go okay we're just wrangling this is there anything you want to say they may have more concerns like if, if people are throwing different kind of feed that's high nitrogen that may be an issue um I, I have no idea what's in feed but i'm just just check with them yeah that's that's a, that's a good idea and i, I think um i mean this regulation doesn't need to be a hundred percent catch-all but i think it's one of those things that when people go to do the permit application it doesn't hurt to have you know once we get this information from building and conservation we can attach it as an amendment, right? And just have them review it. And this is kind of what we're basing it off of. And in certain circumstances, I'm sure we'll still have to refer back to conservation if there's some, you know, some minute details I mean, here and there. But we still, uh, I haven't seen it forever, but Elaine, we used to, Board of Health used to have to look at water plans all the time for developments and, and new houses. And, and we were basically like, you know, we don't, we're not actually, um, in the know about whether this is a proper plan or not, but for some reason, there is a default to the Board of Health from planning. So we just want, you know, we just want to make sense. We want the only to time we, yeah, last year, I believe so. Am I correct, Cindy? Last year we were questioned about wells, wasn't it? Then I had to turn that over to someone who was a um, person. Yep, we get, we get those. Um, probably Levis Lane, they were drilling wells, and yeah. we get those all the yeah, we get them all the time. So we have yeah. review the well plans, yeah, and that is, I mean, that makes sense, but yeah. but that's the but only plugging, time. Um, but plugging into a, 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 a pre existing utility line, I, I, it's confusing, see, I fail to see why we would have anything to say. Well, it's a long story whether or not it pays <laughs> for the water. 
Am I right, Erin? Right, but, Anthony? You know, Who pays for the water? <laughs> it's an opportunity to make these make sense. It might be a good okay. idea, Anthony, to bring somebody from the conservation committee to uh, maybe our next meeting to go over something like that and review that with us so it will help us some um, and maybe even some other regulations or just to understand it a little more like Laurel says. It's confusing. Okay, that sounds good. So do we want to do we want to hold on making this change or do we want to do we want to potentially put something in place and then have to amend it again? I just um, we can obviously leave this right and then we can we can bring a consultant in um, even if they do it in the meantime and then we have the information and then maybe what we can do is just call on a public hearing next time right and then bring this information to you guys and then, that, and then we can deliberate again based on the new information and then just amend this section that's fine you think that would be appropriate yeah fine okay so uh we can leave it as such right now i mean we we were going to get rid of the um distance from prop property lines anyways yep. so i'll leave it as such it'll be in consultation with town affiliated conservation agent um and then the next time we come back we should have some more information uh regarding maybe potential distances from public uh, public waterways so i don't know if you want to put that in a comment and your magic comments yes sir. That we don't see. that's a good idea and then you can blame me Well, I've always wanted to go talk to Benny, so um, this will give me a this will give me a good reason to go talk to him. But it's nice, Laurel, to hear from someone who's gone through it and mm -hmm. to bring it to our attention because I know a couple of times I've been told that things were conservation land, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh no, it really isn't. Oh, okay. Or it is, but we didn't yeah. ask. So yeah, yeah. We got forgiveness instead of permission. And yeah. Then, uh, then yeah, you're right. right. That's true. So, so you It'd know, be nice to be, learn it the right way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a rule follower. Okay, so it looks like um, that's that's good to go. I've, I've made a comment, so we'll remember to address this next time. Um, and I'll, in the in the interim between now and next meeting, we'll we'll consult building and conservation. Um, were there any other questions about housing and the distance from uh, certain distances or setbacks? Okay, so section ten. This is uh, for chickens. And so we had um, we had changed this. Oh, it looks like we did. We didn't go back to changing this. So it looks like last time we had mentioned a density. Um, I think this might just be an outdated version of this. Uh, the maximum number of live fowl. I think we had changed that to two and a half or two square feet. Is that correct, Aaron? Yeah, two square feet per chicken. Um, so however large your property is, if you're able to accommodate all those chickens then we should be allowed to do that. Um, is that is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Okay, okay so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that change there and just say uh, maximum number And I'll, I'll make that wording a little more clear uh, later, but um, okay. So um, I don't believe these are new changes. I think these might just be, it might have been just simpler to change it, but just to go over quickly, um, no roosters shall be kept within Wayfield town limits. Um, all chickens shall be purchased from clean sources uh, from the natural, uh, National Poultry Improvement Plan participants. Uh, so this guarantees that we have um, we have safe chickens. Any person with a permit for chickens will comply with the um, with the state uh, law. The coop and pen requirements: shelter should be cleaned in conformance, uh, no less than once a week. Uh, I don't believe these are yeah these are not new regulations. These are just this is easier to do the edit. So these are all. Um, uh, yeah, I think she just moved some things. <laughs> that was. Yeah, so these are all the same. Oh yeah, yeah, you can see it. Uh, okay, so yep, this is just yeah. So this is all a rewrite of. Because it looks good. Okay. So we had keeping of pigs, and I believe this is not new. Yeah, this is not new either. Um, this was just a, this is moving everything up mm -hmm. um, from the previous regulation. These are not changes. These are also not changes as well. Okay. 
general maintenance. Um, yeah, these are these are all the same. Thing has changed here. I okay, so I think this might be new. Uh, I think this is new actually. So section on pigeons. Uh, looks like we've expanded it quite a bit here. Um, but essentially, I mean, this is relatively new to us. None of us are really experts in pigeons, but um, basically no more than seven pairs of pigeons. Um, I think this is already previously. New birds must be isolated in a separate pen as far from the resident birds as possible for at least 14 days and watch for signs of sickness. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of these changes, but is there are there any questions specifically about pigeons that you guys would like to raise? Well, I wonder, since they're birds, it seems like we're not being consistent with numbers where we didn't have like a specific number of allowed chickens. We do have a specific number of allowed pigeons and it doesn't seem like it's density dependent. That's that's a good point. Um, I, I off the top of my head do not know if there is a best practice you know, per square foot, how much space a pigeon needs. Yeah, I'm um, not like a pigeon pro myself either. <laughs> okay. So um, if we want, maybe the next time, since we're going to re, we're going to address that um, setback question. Maybe in the meantime, we can try and see if there are best practices with pigeons, um, and we'll we'll ask around and see if anybody knows of it. Yeah, it might be. Do you, do you have anything that like foul foul regulations, kind of somewhat consistent? Yeah, I'm no, that, sure that's why, a good point. I'm though. not sure why there's a number for this one. A lot yeah, of this pigeons. was this was definitely. Uh, this was definitely a historical holdover. I I honestly don't know where this came from. Um, Aaron, do you know of any numbers? No. Okay. I don't. There is someone who keeps pigeons um, in Stoneham. He probably has about uh, at least twenty four pigeons. Um, but okay. I've inspected it. It's fine. But there was no. There's no limit. Um, but I, I'm not sure the rationale behind uh, seven pairs of pigeons. That's, that's 14 pigeons. I do remember um, growing up, my grandfather had them. And I do remember a lot of pigeons. And I remember going up and open the cages, as you say, to go out. And then they would come back again. But I don't think many people today really keep pigeons. It's not like, you know, they're, um, I don't know what they're, I don't know what they're, purpose was to be honest with you I never could figure that out but I just did whatever he told me to do you know open up the cages were those, messen were those, messen were those messenger pigeons Elaine I don't know I'm not that old jeez I don't know he had him on top of his bakery and he was an old Italian so um and a neighbor who had some as well yeah you know, this, this is my thought should we have a purveyor of pigeons and they have an issue with our our numbers and they can give us a sound rationale for increasing those, then we grant a variance. Because okay. I way, mean, I think I think you're right. Yeah. It gives us it right. gives us an opportunity to learn mm -hmm. um, from mm -hmm. somebody. So if you know there's somebody very passionate about this and they say, no, this is unacceptable, I need to do more, and this is why, then they can prove it to us. But I, you know, I think it's a reasonable, you're gonna go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Pigeons do fly. You know, I mean, some of them are allowed to fly, so you're not as worried about the proximity, except again, of course, for when, you know, for obvious reasons. So, I, and I just don't think there's any way of, like, I, I don't think it's worth spending the time to reflect best practices any better than this, unless it was brought to our attention and then we felt compelled to, to rewrite it or just grant a variance on that one time. But is this the best practice? I mean, is this like the current? I, that's what I, where did it come from? Right. Who knows? I mean, I don't think so. I think pigeons were years ago. We didn't have chickens. So people had pets more, uh, pigeons as pets, I think. But um, I don't, I, I'm surprised Aaron, there's even anybody. I have never, I don't know of anybody here in Wakefield that has them. Yeah, quails too. Uh, oh, really? Oh, interesting. Are quails within this? This is just pigeons. This is just pigeons. Just okay. pigeons, yeah. All right. I mean, how much time do we invest in this? <laughs> yeah, we don't have any more farmland here in Wakefield. I think there's only one or two properties still um, grandfathered in. The one that uses the goats to um, 
eat their grass and stuff like that. I don't know if you people remember that, but foodscaping. Um, that, yeah. Yeah. It, we this, even like want to have pigeon guidelines then if we feel like it's like it's not something that we see people having. Like, do we even need to have these in here? I have no idea. I think really probably take it out. And then like Laura says, if somebody comes to us and says, I mean, you know, we really and truly want pigeons and then have them explain to us why, what they would do, how they would house them and, you know, how they would take care of them. Maybe that's who, that's where you would learn it from. Yeah, that's but if, I don't like, have a, if we don't have the regulation on the book, they don't have to come to us at all. They're like, you had nothing written about pigeons. Yeah, only... Uh, yeah, I mean, because uh, yeah, the only way we would we would find out probably is if it was somebody complained. <laughs> yeah, if somebody complained about it being a nuisance, mm -hmm. and then we could you know just say it's a nuisance. So mm -hmm. I, I prefer to keep it. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just just because you know. Mm -hmm. And then if somebody comes and tells us they're applying for it, then we can we'll have them go by the the listing of what we need, and then we can probably find out more from them. And learn but but if we don't if we if we get rid of it all together mm -hmm. and somebody suddenly wants to fill the garage with pigeons which i have seen done um then we you know then we have no recourse because we had nothing on the books mm -hmm. so to me i feel like we should at least have a reasonable um effort on the book i don't know if anyone wants to take time to see if there's anything out there that then you know there, there must be an association of of pigeons um, yeah but you know there there still are people who compete and that sort of thing so they may i don't know i think um i think if it's possible we should just we should keep this for now like you're saying um because it you know it, at least it gives us some some level of recourse um if if we do discover any kind of situation um i i actually think it might you know might be worth our time to maybe look into it a little bit because you know um you know worst case scenario we're talking you know if we just come across a case where you know potentially patients are being kept you know in you know poor conditions uh and we have nothing here or to go off of at least we have something to go off of um to uh to make sure that reasonable accommodations are made for the for pigeons so um, in the absence of anything better, maybe we should leave this in here. Okay. I can do some pigeon research. Now I'm interested. <laughs> I'm looking it up right now research. at the University of Florida. So we can do a little research Walmart. project. Okay. Um, so is it, is it okay if we, if we move on from this and then if next time when we, when we address the fed facts, we'll, um, we'll address it as well. When Aaron's going to give us okay. a pigeon lecture. <laughs> Mutual of Omaha. Oh, okay. set, aside, set aside two hours because we'll that's how long it'll take. Oh, um, <laughs> okay, so section 14 complaints. So minor change here. Uh, I think originally it said uh, if there are any complaints regarding termination of a license or animals that are being kept without a license, yes. um, it was 48 hours. We changed it to a business days. Um, is, that, is, that, is that acceptable? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Awesome. Okay. Um, hearings, variances, and enforce. I think we changed. I think we changed section 16 from enforcement to variances. Um, so if there's any changes, um, and we, if the board, if the board receives a complaint following individuals claiming grounds exist for termination, um, this is the same thing as before. So we have 48 hours um, to respond to a termination of license, um, and we got rid of the grandfather clause. Um, so the grandfather clause essentially was that any property owner that had that had kept animals prior to 1980, July 17, 1986, and they continue to use that land for keeping of animals, um, that shall not exceed those kept prior to 1986. Um, that's a very, I think it's very specific. I think it's, uh, I think we can all agree that keeping of animals should probably just be based on best practices that we already have outlined. Um, no grandfathering in public health. Let's <laughs> slippery slope. Oh, elder abuse. Um, if you didn't use to wash your hands back in the day, you don't have to wash your hands now. <laughs> You'll be fine. But that's, I've gotten in the grandfather clauses when it comes to a restaurant and them going into an old place and saying like, oh, it's grandfathered in. And I'm like, you can't grandfather out like washing hands. Like that's, uh, <laughs> Sanitation. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so I believe in terms of changes. Um, Board are inaccurate. Here, so. What does that say? So we, sorry, so, uh, sorry, say one more time. The thing that the board are in inaccurate or what? So it's just bad link. Facts containing the application or is represented by the lessons to the board. Oh, got it. Sorry, it was just a weird. Oh, place it, place. The, the, the cutoff was an inconvenient spot. It looked like we were saying something about the board being like inaccurate. Board <laughs> <laughs> no, the board is perfect. The, the no is. mistakes are ever made. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the last section we need to discuss is uh, section 19 about penalties. Um, I know before this was previously we had a five dollar penalty for every day um, for not following regulation. I think that's probably not in keeping with you know housing code violations, food code violations. You know, so um, do we want to discuss kind of a reasonable expectation for penalties? I want it not onerous but have teeth. Uh, Twenty. <laughs> yeah. Any takers? What do you think? I mean, I would start. I would start off at twenty-five. Um, does that seem? Does that seem punitive? I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's a daily fine, but generally speaking, we communicate, you know, with them pretty extensively. Education before, you know, it's uh, it's not a, it's not an immediate start finding, right? We we do use all the tools before we start finding. So, yeah. you, um, you guys. What's that? I, you know. We could write like when the fines would start to be enforced. Oh yeah, I mean the, the fines, I mean, generally speaking, the fines would start after an order to correct has been sent and the time frame has, you know, has been exceeded. Yeah, so, the violation it's a, it's a, so the violation doesn't exist until the order of correction's been sent. So that's kind of within it. Right. And they've passed the reasonable time that they have to Appeal like it. carry out yeah. those corrections. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if it's, a, if it's an emergency condition, generally speaking, it's immediately or 24 hours uh, or 48, depending. But um, if, you know, and if it's not, then it's five days. But any exceeding any of those time frames, generally, just like a housing code violation would would trigger uh, fining. But we would have communication beforehand. So. And then is there like, I mean, is there a certain amount of time where like, I don't know, after two weeks of like not correcting this and accumulating fines, like, is there gonna be more like further penalties? Like the animals have to be removed from the property or? I think at that point we would take it to court. Okay. Yeah. Like we after take it to court, we take... days of like being out of compliance. Yeah, we would contact yeah. town council and move forward with uh, a court date. Okay. Yeah. And part and part of it is, you know, one of the tools is revoking an animal permit. Um, that's that's a pretty simple one, right? So fines, revoking a permit, and then taking them to court. That would those are all um, tools that we have in the toolbox. So, um, okay, so we can we can include that in the wording. But did we did we agree to twenty five as kind of being an appropriate amount per that's day? Fine. I think that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're also just going to change it so that, uh, let me see, uh, generally speaking, when we do these regulations, we also have a little addendum that says every day, con each each separate day constitutes, or each day constitutes a separate violation, just, just so we're clear that each day we can find $25 for non-compliance okay. um, after the time period. Okay. Keep picking. That sounds good. So I will click. I will I will keep. I'll make this twenty-five, but then I'll I'll clean up. I'll clean up this draft of the regulation so that we can have a final to uh, take a quick scan of, of the five dollars. Um, Anthony. Oh, yes. Thank you. How we write prescriptions also. So he's going to get that. Yes. Uh, okay. So I believe that 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 concludes our um, oh, our animal regulations uh, <laughs> review. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone, for contributing to this. Um, do, do we have any questions, or are we good to move on? We're, I, I'm good. Laurel, Elaine. Fine. Okay. And oh, so, what's, yeah. The next step is you're going to read it up, and then we're going to vote on it, vote to accept it next time. Um, we can we can vote to accept it. We can as, vote to accept it this time as is, okay. and then we can. I guess if we wanted to make the changes to the setback and potentially pigeons, um, we could call a public hearing, make changes to it, and then okay. go to accept that new copy. Have we passed our due diligence for public meeting? 
Uh, it looks like there's no public participation right now. Um, that was in the notice for tonight. I'm just, I'm just. Thinking. Yes, it was. was. Yes, yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah, it's been in the. It was in the paper for a week. Perfect. Yeah. This, this is the second. A hearing. We are the public. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, this is our second public hearing about this. All right. <laughs> so I guess. Yeah. Thank you, everyone? board members, for your very like cons very good feedback on on all this it was really helpful does anybody want to make a motion to accept the regulations with the proposed amendments i'll make a motion to accept the regulations for the keeping of animals with the um changes that are present um as of today I second corville all in favor silver aye corville aye linehan aye so moved Great, awesome, thanks everybody. That's a lot of work um, and a lot of thought. Um, good discussion too. Um, health director's report. Um, only a very, a very short, a very short report this time. Um, we were, um, we were lucky to have um, introductions earlier, but again, we we have uh, two great new employees. Uh, we have Sandra and um, Dan joining us now. Um, Sandra has been working closely with Melissa to bring um, blood pressure clinics back to the Council on Aging, so we're partnering with them as well on that initiative. Um, so we're going to be working on those programs. Uh, just a quick uh, review of the Living Well Fair um, that was this past Saturday. Uh, one of those you know, it's one of those things that uh, moving forward we can do a better job of communication. Uh, I realized the board was not in, was, was not uh, informed that this was happening. Um, but we did partner with Chamber of Commerce and many other organizations um, that were very helpful for um, promoting lots of different resources. Um, and we're uh, we're excited to uh, be able to do some outreach. We also did blood pressures. We provided sunscreen, tick and mosquito information. Um, Aaron was there, and Melissa and Catherine as well. Um, we did, you know, we met a lot of people in the community, and it was just it was just good to see everybody out and about again after two years of relative isolation. So um, it was smart yep, to have it right next to the farmers market, and it was a great day for it. So it was. There was a lot of traffic. It was good. Do we yep. do we have any? Um, we started booking flu clinics, and do we want to do with one with farmers market and give us enough notice so I can get? Yeah, that? I think uh, I think Melissa yeah. has a date for it, right? I think she has a date for the farmers market um, already. Oh, great. There is town day on October the eighth, and yeah. uh, there is a farmers oh, holiday weekend. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Here we go holiday weekend. Right, I'm not going to be here, so <laughs> sorry. Well. <laughs> I'll try, Melissa. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. I will look into my busy calendar. <laughs> we would appreciate it. And anytime you guys can help is, is absolutely great. Um, I just wanted to say that we, uh, Denise, Cindy, Anthony, and I had a pre-meeting, and we're trying to block in dates for vaccine clinics. Um, and we're, we are going to be at this town day and also at the um, farmer's market from nine to 12, and then at the town day from one to four. Oh. So we'll just move oh. the whole operation up to a different part of the common and You're start there. Yourself. We don't want you burning out by November. I know. She's taking Mom. Tuesday, she'll take Tuesday off too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, just so you know, we did 27 blood pressures at the last event. That's great. And the range of diastolic was? <laughs> Below I think 90. mine was the highest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, they, the people actually get it done. Oh, good. Good job, Melissa. Thank you. Um, and I think... Besides town day, um, we're, we're going to be releasing a, a tentative schedule for clinics moving forward for the fall um, pretty soon to the board uh, once we once we fully nail down those dates. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's pretty much where we're at. We've started having discussions. So this is um, something that we've started, started having discussions about. So the, uh, are you guys familiar with the tobacco-free generation project? 
The Tobacco Free Generation Project was something that was started by uh, the town of Brookline. Uh, I believe in November of 2020, they passed a town ordinance essentially restricting all tobacco sales within the town of Brookline um, to all individuals born after the year 2000. Uh, that timing uh, means puts it at anybody that was not 21 at that time would no longer be able to purchase uh, tobacco products moving forward. And so, um, you know, obviously, you know, we don't need to belabor the point, but Wakefield has been one of those um, out, you know, has been out in front in terms of prevention work, um, lots of outreach to the community. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on substance use prevention. Uh, all of these activities basically amount to, you know, basically engaging the public, making sure that the information is out there. But this tool, in terms of a policy, would be, a, you know, would be great in terms of prevention. Um, the statistics are pretty clear. I believe it's um, most uh, most regular smokers, uh, adult smokers, started before the age of 18. I think it's 80 percent. Uh, and I believe between the age, ages of 18 to 25, it's 90 percent um, of regular smokers started. And so something to keep in mind is that tobacco is a always evolving field, right? So um, nicotine products, at least in the state of Massachusetts, the definition uh, for tobacco also includes nicotine products. We're seeing, you know, some variations. We're seeing nicotine pouches, things that don't, don't traditionally fall under tobacco, but are, you know, very dangerous and are very addictive. Um, these products would also, nicotine products will also be caught in this as well. But essentially what we're looking for is to kind of socialize the idea of um, a regulation um, similar in scope uh, here in Wakefield um, that would that would address um, purchases of tobacco. So if we were to uh, address this this year, we would essentially move the year up to 20, uh, 2001. So anybody born after the year 2001 would no longer be able to purchase a tobacco products. This is one of those things that um, has garnered a lot of attention. Um, there are definitely some legal challenges with that. Um, and we'd like to kind of discuss this again with the board um, after uh, presenting more presenting more research. Is this under the auspices of Wake Up or no? This would be something that we would involve uh, Wake Up Coalition as well. Um, I think uh, any successful policy needs to engage all stakeholders. And I think Wake Up is a great place for that. Um, so I think wake up and as well town council and the board of health, obviously, you know, three, three large pillars of the community in substance, substance prevention, substance use prevention. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, can yeah, I just, so, can I just also mention that, um, the two interns did a wonderful presentation uh, about yeah. the tac tobacco project. Oh, cool. Did we tape it? Um, it was taped, I think. Yes. We'll we'll do some research and make it available. It was uh, it was recorded. They presented it at the uh, the end of end of summer BU uh, intern showcase. Um, so we can definitely provide that as well as as well as the PowerPoint format for it. But they had a lot of good data. They did what we basically want to do, but don't have the time to do, which is doing interviews, doing group doing group uh, interviews. Um, those were so valuable to find out where, you know, what the temperature basically in Wakefield is for tobacco use, what the kids are seeing and what, you know, it basically augments some of that work that Wake Up is already doing um, and basically gives us another perspective. Um, so don't forget to include that so, in your annual report that we partnered with Boston University and we're able to do oh, absolutely. a comprehensive blah, 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 blah. Like you, you, just, you just want to capture that. I mean, it's those annual reports, some people, I read them. Um, but I think it's it's nice just to remember, especially as we're growing, you know, and and trying to express our our breadth of scope and practice um, with our new title as HHS. I think we need to be able to say give examples as to we're thinking more broadly and we're making academic um, connections. Like you know, it's good to be involved with public health students. And to show that you know we're we're part of that process. So and that's it. Good idea. Um, I think that's that's all I had. Were there any other questions? Um, where are we on the hires that are have we not finalized hires for? Uh, I don't know what I was involved in on for for youth coach and um. And substance use. 
Uh, oh, uh, sorry, prevention and wellness coordinator and the social services coordinator. Mm -hmm. So we have, we've made offers and they've both officially accepted. We are, we're just waiting for the paperwork to formalize, but we are very excited to have um, two individuals joining us under the under the department uh, for social service coordinator, prevention and wellness coordinator that's uh, under the DFC grant, prevention and wellness. Um, yeah, we're very excited. These two individuals are very qualified. I probably will just want to wait until the paperwork is finalized, but um, we are in the final stages here. Um, so. Hopefully by next meeting, we'll have both of them on to do formal introductions. Um, but yeah, these two positions are extremely valuable. And as a segue to that, it hasn't happened since Elaine and I have been on the board, but prior to being on the board, um, the board has had the um, opportunity to do executive session at some point. And I just want to, I just want the board to think about it as we are growing so much. Um, I think it's not a bad idea to utilize the executive um, session opportunity for us all to collectively kind of air any issues that may be, you know, or even just identifying personnel and who is doing what that should not be happening in a public board meeting. It should be happening in executive. It might not be a bad idea um, to just chat with Tom Mullen and say, hey, you know, just give us some guidance. We haven't done it for so long, but you know, I, I would just like to be proactive in using it as a tool because we, you know, we can't talk to each other. But I think with our history, that there are some things, a collective history of just being in town for the period of time that we have. I think that the board may have some insight um, and, and may want to utilize that opportunity. Um, and it would, you know, executive sessions can sometimes be with just the health director or the health director and the town manager so that we have an opportunity um, to do this. Town council and school committee does it all the time because they're dealing with unions and contracts. Luckily, we're protected from, you know, we don't do that. But it's kind of just come to my mind as we grow and things can get a little, um, can get complicated as we grow and even just having an opportunity to talk with either um, town manager or town council about what we can and cannot expect of, of, or, or what the what the constraints of any um, union rules might be so that we, we don't trip over anything. Um, it's just a thought that, that I was, it's just occurred to me recently. I think that's a, a good idea, Laurel. It's um when you grow and you have, um, if you're a director, as I always say to Anthony, I always got to have those union rules in that notebook right beside you. Um, and I did that today in doing a teaching for nursing students and, and for the faculty, you know, you got to have your handbook with you at all times because you don't know. And I think in growing, we sometimes, where we can't really sit and talk and say to somebody, you know, okay, this is what you do, but what is that going to do for us down the line in five months? What are you going to be able to give to us? Or what are you going to be able to give to us that will go back into the community? I think we sometimes have to defy our roles and, and see, you know, what we are and who we are and what our jobs are and how we can work better together. I feel if you, if you can actually sit there and really talk about it. I mean, I, I, I need to, remind myself what, you know, a, appropriate um, topics for executive session are. I mean, I know it definitely has to do, you know, if there's any arbitration, clearly that's executive, but I, I think, you know, I, I think I might just want to explore that. So I'm just putting that out there. Something to look into, I think. I agree. I don't know, Candice, uh, you've run into that, but I know what it's like when you, you really need that executive session to kind of mull over things you know yeah I think I think it's a, it's a great idea um do you guys think it's something we want to plan for a particular meeting or do you think that maybe we should schedule a different meeting for the executive session I well first of all I think you have to be very particular and what and I can't I think we need some guidance from town council and I don't know Candace if you want to do that or you want me to call him um just to say, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking. What are the guidelines? Um, because generally it's a very specific executive session about period. Um, 
it has to be it has to be vague enough you know so so let us all you know let let's see if it let me let me make a call this is my recommendation let me make a call to town to to tom and just say is there um an executive session guidebook you know like why would you use it how would you use it how do you announce it um but i think especially being that we can't have subcommittees <laughs> just for three i think um wouldn't there is there a resource through the mass health board so. association or ma mahd they reasonable. probably have something yeah. more health board specific yeah okay i mean it's I training. The questions yeah. is, is common, but, their training will yeah. be coming back again this year anthony for people who are on boards of health to attend that that's usually a yep. one day training um i've done it and i've taught at it i don't know if laurel or candace have gone um it's a, a very long day but you really do learn a lot about I, I a little did it different when things. i first joined the board yeah um, i did yeah. mine back then so yeah i think we, I, don't the, I, I don't know that 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 isn't really in it um no i i think well let me let me see what it's I can do and I will I'll let you all know. Okay. I just can I have a question. Um, Anthony, did you look into um the meeting um in public for boards and committees now in towns and with the um stipulation that we would be able to meet in public and then have the Zoom opportunity also at the meeting for those? Um is that is that the new understanding after July with the governor? Or I know there's a couple of different things that they've been signing and doing. Yeah, so from my understanding, and I, I gotta clarify with Sherry again, but I, I, I reached out to Sherry to ask um, what the situation essentially for in-person in meetings is, what the stipulations are. Um, from what I understand, we just need to have, um, we just need to have the combinations for people tuning in virtually. Uh, whether that's Zoom or whatever our platform, I, I, we obviously use Zoom, but um, yeah, I think we have to just be able to find a place to accommodate us. Um, I think before it was really a scheduling challenge with the town in terms of facilities that were able to provide this, um, especially public hearings. I mean, not not like ours tonight because it was uh, not super well attended, but um, in general, if we needed to, if we needed space for uh, attendees uh, for a public hearing or something like that, um, we we may struggle to find that space, but Again, it's it's something that we can work on to get back into person, uh, to get back to to in person uh, meetings. Uh, I can I can get the specifics from Sherry uh, to see if we can make that happen. So. All right, been a pleasure. Okay. I missed you the month of July. It's already August. Can't believe it. After school, next meeting. <laughs> Who's got the? Okay. Candace, you're always good about the next. uh 21 is it the third yeah that's Fine. right are we doing six or seven i prefer seven six hurt trying to get out of work was there a re we did six because of the zoom run wasn't available cindy or was no uh, we we talked about changing it to six going forward did we yep and we thought oh yeah so be easy <laughs> for them yeah i don't know i mean I all right <laughs> I don't have anything. I don't work on Wednesdays <laughs> unless Melissa calls me. I like your, I like your, I like your schedule, Elaine. Yeah, well, it's it's going to be busier. It's going to be busier. I missed a couple of meetings today because of going to an orientation for for something else. So I uh, I really am. But I mean, I know six is difficult because I, you know, I can do six. I, just, I couldn't remember. Why. Mm. <laughs> I thought fine. we had changed it, and then we were thinking I, that in terms of meeting and for you know anthony and them in the health department yeah, and candace you sooner. you'll hit the traffic candace coming home from work with the t down so for the next month or so you you know i don't know i mean six is fine with me if you want yeah, to keep fine. it i just it's okay I, it's fine six is fine. fine okay anything else okay um uh, i guess i would take a motion to I, I make a motion to adjourn the meeting at I will, and I will second that motion. All in favor? Gorville, aye. Silver, aye. Uh, on, on mute, Mr. Yeah, Mr. I, I actually, um, 
I actually got um, an email from uh, Mr. Zolot. Um, I'll I'll reach out. So he's he's requesting information on what we talked about for the Sakura um, inspection today, or the the report that we got from Dan. So um, we'll that's that's public record. So we'll just uh, we'll clarify that. Give it over to him. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zolot. Thank you. Good night. Uh, thank you, board members. <laughs> thank you, Melissa. Good night, everybody. Right. Have a good night, everyone. Take good care, Bye. everybody.